pleasure to be here today. A lot of people have taken a look at the role of climate engineering on changes to the atmosphere, but very few people have spent any time looking at the ocean. To my knowledge right now, I think there's one study by Kelly McCusker uh, looking at that. And uh, my colleagues and I decided that it would be interesting to try and uh, take a look at some of the results from GeoMIP in, uh, with respect to ocean changes. So I, I, at this time, I'll take the opportunity to introduce you to Hansi Singh, who's a graduate student at the University of Washington, and Ben Kravitz, who's a postdoc working with me at PNNL. And um, uh, they did all the heavy lifting, really. I'm uh, providing guidance, and, but uh, they're the ones doing the model simulations and uh, analysis, or some of the model simulations. So. Uh, I think there are a lot of people in the room who probably know what GeoMIP is, but for those who don't, I'll just remind you here. This is the GeoMIP Geoengineering, another name for climate engineering or climate intervention, uh, model intercomparison project. And there's a web page here which I'm uh, pointing you to, and for those interested in some of the scientific results, there's a JGR special issue that appeared last year, and uh, issues are, or articles are still being added to it. So you can look here and see the modeling teams. There are about 20 model groups around the world that are participating and a bunch of resources that are being allocated for doing computer simulations. These simulations are available freely and um, uh, through a variety of mechanisms. You can learn more about it at the web page. As I said, there, there's to date been very little focus on assessing sunlight reduction impacts on uh, oceans, and so we decided to take a look at it. For this study, we've chosen to focus on eight models from GeoMIP. I've listed them here, and uh, we really, they were just the first eight models that we could parse the ocean output from, so there was no, no reason to choose these out of the 20. We're going to focus primarily on model experiment G1, and for those who uh, haven't seen it before, what we do is to run uh, a simulation with a control set of forcings, usually pre-industrial forcings, for a period of time to reach equilibrium, and then instantaneously quadruple CO2, and simultaneously balance this with a reduction in sunlight just sufficient to balance the top of atmosphere forcing to about a tenth of a watt per meter squared. You have to do a little bit of iteration initially to, to determine the amount of sunlight reduction that's needed, it's usually between 3 and 5 percent for these models. So what we, what we do is to compare a four times CO2 simulation and a G1 simulation to the pre-industrial reference or control simulation. And because the simulations are relatively short, these, e these experiments are not reaching an equilibrium. So what we're really doing is just looking for signatures of change, but not uh, more than that. So uh, to give you a feel for the degree of variation that you're going to see in these, I've chosen to display all the, uh, sim the surface te sea surface temperature for all the simulations that we're looking at. These are the annually averaged SST changes. And in the black box that you see at the bottom uh, left corner, I've highlighted the, the simulations for the four times CO2 for the GIS model on the right and the uh, G1 simulation, the geoengineered simulation on the left, and um, you can see the other seven pairs as well uh, on the rest of the slide. The uh, surface temperature changes are shown, you can see the color bar below you, and uh, what you'll notice here is that the four times CO2 simulations you, in the annual average sense are even over this, these 50-year time periods have increased by four degrees or greater uh, over most of the planet for the, uh, the ungeoengineered un simulations. And when you impose geoengineering, you see uh, a, a different signature with um, SST changes then uh, of uh, essentially the, the main signal is a cooling in the tropics of order half a degree uh, or less and uh, slight warming at high latitudes often appearing in the Atlantic or Northern Pacific. So there are some common features around here. You can, I, I've shown you all of them to show you some of the variability across these uh, features. There's 
oftentimes uh, less cooling at the southern uh, Antarctic circumpolar current area and uh, in many of the models. Less warming. It's less, yeah, less warming, thanks, that's a better way to say it. Okay, and then also less warming in the North Atlantic, in the deep water formation area in, in many models. For the geoengineered models, uh, you can see uh, a, uh, a warming, a frequent warming in the, the North Pacific and sometimes in the North Atlantic as well. Now, uh, th that kind of a plot has been shown before be with the focus on the atmosphere as well, but I'm going to start penetrating deeper into the ocean at this point in the game. So I'm showing you the potential temperature changes at 1,000 meters depth here. And you can see the, the signatures across the uh, models are beginning to depart more for the four times CO2 runs. There's more variability across the, this column and this column. Uh, but again, the, the signatures are that uh, the geoengineering has done a very good job, in fact, of maintaining the control temperatures at depth. These are uh, zonally averaged cross sections of the annual averages, and uh, they, this is to give you a better feel for the differences. Some of the features that you see are the same, cooling in the tropics near the surface, slight warming at high latitudes. The warming penetrates much more deeply because this is where the deep water formation occurs. Um, there are some signatures, like in this model, the Miroc model, where there's a cooling near the, uh, or at, at uh, in both the geoengineered and the four times CO2 simulations, suggesting that that model may not, in fact, be at near equilibrium and that um, there might be some problems there. The GIS model is uh, an unusual one as well. The mixing that's taking place with the heat is much different from the other models, and we don't understand that at this point. There are changes in the surface salinity as well, and I've chosen to highlight uh, a couple of features. There in the four times CO2 runs, we see a common signature of increased Atlantic salinity in the tropics, decreases the salinity most other places. Uh, and in the G1 simulations, you can see, and I've only chosen to highlight one case for each in the G1 and four times CO2, but they're common uh, in many of the model simulations. You can see a uh, freshening, a, a decrease in salinity in the uh, subtropics and tropics off the coast of Africa. And this is associated with, uh, we think, with a, a change in both the ITCZ and the intensity of the um, precipitation coming out of the, or of river flow coming out of the Congo. There's also changes in surface winds, and these changes in surface winds in, end up driving a surface current change as well. And I know you can't see a lot on this what you're seeing here is a superposition of a bunch of arrows, some, you can get a hint for it here, indicating the surface current change, and the intensity of the color is indicating the intensity of the current speed change. So um, what you can see are significant changes in tropical uh, wind stresses in the four times CO2 runs, the, uh, the two columns where the uh, changes are largest, and much reduced signatures of wind changes in the uh, geoengineered simulation. But there are frequent signatures in the Pacific uh, in many of the models, um, even in the geoengineered simulations. And you can see those changes in wind stress and in the surface currents having an impact on the thermodynamics as well. So in this case, we're showing you a equatorial Pacific transect of temperature. The black lines here are the control simulation. The, the, these are the um, thermocline, essentially defining the thermocline for us for each model, and you can see the differences in the thermal structure of the ocean for each of these models. And the colors here are showing you the um, intensity of the change in temperature for that particular model. So what you're essentially seeing is a shoaling of the, uh, the thermocline in the 
or the mixed layer in the uh, western part of the Central Pacific here, in all of these. If you look at the changes in the zonal wind fields over the oceans, you can see in the lower panel the, um, the really significant changes in wind speeds that take place in the uh, southern hemisphere mid-latitudes. Um, this is associated with essentially a poleward shift of the mid-latitude jet, particularly in the southern hemisphere, as I've noted in the text. And all of that essentially goes away in the G1 simulation, where there's the, the changes in the surface wind speeds are much smaller. And in fact, there's a slight equatorward shift of the mid-latitudes jets, both in the northern and southern um, <coughs> hemispheres, and uh, a modest decrease in the equatorial easterlies as well. So these changes induce changes in uh, meridional overturning circulation. There is a reduction in uh, poleward heat transport in both hemispheres, and also a reduction in the, um, in the, the northward transport that occurs at the, at the equatorial regions as well in the, from, from the MOC. So this is a, a very brief and kind of sort of superficial look at this point in the game, but it'll be fun to kind of tease out the, the reasons for some of these phenomena. The model responses are suggesting, like we see in the atmosphere as well, that many of the strongest ocean effects for greenhouse gas warming would be reduced by geoengineering, if you believe the models. We see those signatures in the temperature, the salinity, and in ocean currents. There is a consistent signature in the models for a freshening in the subtropical Atlantic from the Congo outflow. <coughs> Poleward heat transport decreases in both hemispheres. And the changes in the surface wind stress are producing most of the signatures that we've seen here, the, the, uh, with perhaps the exception of the very high lo latitude deep water formation signatures. But Equatorial wind changes are decreasing the east-west temperature gradient, producing a, a shoaling of the thermocline. The mid-latitude wind ch uh, changes, particularly in the northern hemisphere, are shifting the subtropical gyrus southward and decreasing the poleward heat transport by ocean circulations. Um, and you can see uh, indications of this when you look for signatures in the MOC as well. Lastly, there's hints of residual changes to surface wind fields in the equatorial Pacific that might also influence ENSEL. And I'll stop here and ask the questions. Yeah, Danny. The results should be quite sensitive, I believe, to the form of geoengineering that you applied. You didn't say, I didn't hear it. That's right. I, I agree with that, too. So uh, I have, there are some common signatures. Uh, I, in unpublished results, I've actually looked at the role of the uh, marine cloud brightening type geoengineering on ocean circulations as well. And some of the tropical signatures that you see are similar. There are, uh, they tend to maximize in the Pacific, and they, you tend to see a La, a La Nina-like response in the ocean temperature field. So there, there could be the, the uh, common signatures in terms of the last ENSO, but uh, in the last uh, issues associated with ENSO. But um, for many of the others, it, it's uncertain, and we'll have to spend some time looking at what the role of um, particular choices for geoengineering technique will be on these situations. <laughs>